2003, Dr. Edward Tamale Sali set out to establish the first IVF clinic in the East and Central Africa. A year later, the clinic registered the first successful IVF baby in the region. It's now 19 years ever since the clinic was established and it has so far spread its wings in Uganda, Tanzania, and Zambia. Today, we present to you Dr. Edward Tamale Sali, the proprietor of Women's Hospital International and Fertility Center. Praise the Lord, Doctor. Amen. Okay, uh, thanks for being here. Today, we need to, you to walk us through your journey as a fertility doctor. So who is Dr. Tamale Sali? Dr. Tamale Sali um, was born in Masaka in a place called Jabakuza. Um, it's about four miles away from town on Barra Road. I was born in a family of uh, 10. My father had an um, extended family. Altogether, we were about 45. Wow. I came to not only 25. 45 The, the other is 20. I, I didn't know where they are. From one man? From one man. That is wonderful. 45 but my mother, you. my mother, official marriage was, we are 10. She had a miscarriage. Okay. Um, so we remained 10. Four brothers and six sisters. Wow, that's wonderful. 10 out of 45. Okay, that's interesting. Ah, uh, Tell us about your personal family, away from your father's family. My personal family, we have five children, three boys and uh, two girls. They are not by IVF. Okay. I need to emphasize that okay. one. The natural conception. Okay. Five babies. Okay, uh, doctor, um, we see the world putting much attention on population reduction. In other words, stopping people from giving birth. But here you are, if I teach the doctor, trying as much as possible to give people, to help people get babies. Where did you draw that inspiration? Uh, I drew this inspiration from my mother, who was a traditional midwife. She used to treat patients at home. Actually, she had a clinic at home, one of the rooms. A clinic? Would you yeah. call it a clinic? Or it is something I would say else? now I call it a clinic, but the other one is that clinic was partly in the, in the, in the banana bush, partly at, in the veranda. So she was successful. And most of our money, we sponsored most of us to go to school. But I was one of those people who, who attended a lot of deliveries for, because we had a lot of goats, and these goats were delivering at home. So there was no other people apart from me who was to, you know, so I delivered goats and, and cows. So while your mother was delivering people, yeah, you were uh, delivering animals. Animals. Quite interesting. <laughs> Quite interesting and inspiring. Okay, so uh, that journey, how, what, what, at what moment did you realize that actually you should become a bath attendant? Because my mother attended my mother's last bath, delivery of my sister, my youngest sister. She's now, she died, but she's, when I was at the age of five, six, my mother delivered all our babies from the, behind the house in the banana plantation. Without any medical attention. Without any medical attention. Because she was a specialist herself in the way she was delivering others, so mm. she should. She was able to help herself. Yeah, so she made a mistake, which turned out to be a blessing. She forgot the Caesar. And, uh, you know, imagine at the age of six, you don't even understand, you don't know what's the pregnancy, you, you simply see women with big tummy, you don't know whether they're And then you see a baby. And then you see a baby. So mm. she, she delivered, she called me, please, my name was Tamale, bring, that time she was not a scissor, it was just a razor blade, a jirita, you know, they called small, That's yeah, sharp. Small, yeah, sharp. She told me um, she forgot it to breathe because she was lying down. Mm -hmm. There was no way she could come over to, to pick it. it, it yes. So I'm lucky. That was the, the real start of my... So I went there. I saw she was lying down. I didn't know why she was lying down like that. And uh, then she told me, go back. So I went back. After 30 minutes, I heard a baby crying. So I didn't go. I think my sister went. 
And then eventually I found that she had delivered. So from that time I started thinking, it's my mother. Uh, she was alone. As I grew up, I came to realize that she was actually in a very d dangerous position because if she could have bled, um, got tetanus infection, maybe my sister would have, you know, died also. So from that time, you know, went on uh, thinking about that I can never forget up to now, as I'm telling you. So that image is stuck into your yeah, mind. Yeah, stuck and then mind. here you start school. So tell us about your journey in school from maybe school, primary to university. I attended, I attended, uh, I was actually bottom of the class in Kimwany Primary School. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting one. Because Number last in class. Yeah, I used to be one of uh, one or two last in the class. So, I think the, this attributed for because I was at home and uh, looking after gods. So these kids who look after gods sometimes they are clever, but they don't have opportunity. But my breakthrough came when I went to medical. To, I went to to be the secondary school. Uh, my sister applied for me to be the second school. That was in which class? Um, senior two. And that's where my breakthrough came. I've never heard of anything about science. I didn't know anything. But then when I got there, I, f I found it's talking about chemistry, um, chloroform, you know, <laughs> <laughs> photosynthesis, things like that. So I got mm. so interested. Those strange terms yeah, are quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Then um, started senior two, uh, midterm. Then went to senior three. By senior three, I was the top on science. <laughs> From bottom? <laughs> From top. bottom, yeah. Okay. What Sciences. did you do differently? Hmm? What did you do differently? From moving from bottom to top of class? Prayer. I just prayed. Yeah, that, that's the time when I got saved. God can translate. So I had a scripture in James, um, chapter 5, I think, that if any man lacks wisdom, knowledge, or anything, pray. I think that is James chapter 1, verse 5. Yeah, something. Oh, yeah, James, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you prayed and... Yeah, and so the continued. whole thing was complete. In fact, it was a surprise that in Senior 3, Buganda Kingdom, they had, they had uh, uh, scholarships. So they gave me a scholarship. I never paid school fees in Senior 3 and Senior 4. Actually, I never paid anything from that time up to when I... Even the university was paid for. Wow. <laughs> So joining university, where did you go and which course did you do at university? Now, you when, can I, take us when I finished time. A level, I did very well. So the Uganda government gave me a scholarship to go and do medicine in Oxford, in the UK. <coughs> From bottom of class yeah. to Oxford on sponsorship. Now, during as I was about to go, the, there was political... He, but he's, this man called Obote, eh? Obote. Milton Obote was overthrown <coughs> by Idi Amin in 1971, I think, 70. Around that time, the British government withdrew my scholarship and others. So other students were also going, but I was going there to Oxford. Others were going to do, um, I don't know, I knew about myself. So that time the government kept me in the university to do physics and uh, botany, something like that. That's yeah. My yeah, as I was waiting to go to UK, just as a way, it was just a waiting period. So <clears throat> I'd be doing something. So when the scholarship was cancelled, the government um, took me to the medical school. They ordered, they gave me a place, so I was late for four months. So then did well, and then when I finished medical school, the, the university retained me to be a lecturer. At Makere? Yeah. Okay. How, how did you feel about that, that opportunity, that offer? That offer was great because it enabled me to do studies, uh, to do anatomy as I was aspiring to become a surgeon. 
So it gave me time to read, uh, to see. And that, the surgeon is, you have to go through anatomy. So this is what basically was, was um, double, double sword, basically. I was killing two birds with one with stone. One stone. Yeah, basically. Okay, so it's trained mm. to a certain trained Meanwhile, well. you still had the other image of mom giving birth alone mm. and then inspiring yeah. it yeah. to become a birth attendant. Yeah. Okay, so uh, for how long did you teach at Makere and what happened Makere, after teaching? Makere, was, the course was five years, so I knew from the very beginning, from my first year, that I, want to, I wanted to become a midwife, like my, my mother, but a more qualified professional midwife. Mm -hmm. That time I didn't even know about obstet obstetrics and anything, but I wanted to be a doctor, but become a midwife, mm -hmm. which is actually obstetrician mm -hmm. at Ghana College. Kind of colleges, which I am now. Okay, that's wonderful. Mm. Dr. Sally, I understand at one point in life you had to leave Uganda and go to the UK. What events were happening at that time? When I finished medical school, I became a assistant lecturer in anatomy in, in the medical school. So I was planning to eventually to go and do my postgraduate in the UK. However, during that time, during, uh, I mean, time, it was a really difficult time. So the Archbishop was killed on 17th of February, um, 1977. That's uh, Archbishop Janano. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And he killed also the, the other minister, who was my friend. He was uh, Minister of Finance and also the Chief of Police. Now, these bodies were brought in Mulago, and because me working in anatomy and mortuary, because we are dealing with anatomy and mortuary, we are working together. We're getting bodies for medical students to see. So I sent my technician there to check, and he told me the bodies are there. They've been shot. So immediately, I took my car. I went to Masaka to see my mother, and I told her, I'm, I'm leaving Uganda because I knew things were, might even come to, to me. A day before, a week before that, I'd been um, taken out by these uh, means people. And uh, because I was driving a car, they wanted to steal the car. <laughs> <laughs> so I realized this was the day I could be. So my mother told me, please run away. Yeah. So I dressed up as a mechanic. We took a Kamba bus. Uh, my passport was hid in the back of my, you know, my underwear. Yeah. Because they would ask, stop you and they say, where are you going? Because people were running away that time. But, you know, um, I took almost nothing. I abandoned my car and I went by road to Malaba and then went to Kenya. Okay. And, it's, um... and then from Kenya... It was a professor who was called Bucket. In fact, he discovered a, a disease condition, Bucket's sleeve form. I know these tumors, which, oh, yes. yeah, the, the he was, Ruga. yeah, he was, no, it's called Bucket's lymphoma. Bucket's lymphoma. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, I think this Bucket's lymphoma is a big, big tumor, lymphoma. Now, this chap was uh, a friend of mine, he was a Christian. And he, he had discovered also other things, bururi arusa, and also high fiber diet is the one actually introduced high fiber that can reduce uh, some illnesses. Then he got me a ticket, bought me a ticket from UK and uh, picked up a plane from, from Nairobi. And I went straight to Nottingham University, where I was a connection with another Christian doctor there, gynecologist. And I... I so while in Nottingham, what did you do? The UK training is usually two years. So um, I was there for two years, over which time I graduated as an obstetrician, gynecologist. Also, I wanted to become a, a surgeon, a renal surgeon, so that if I came back to Uganda, I could deal with, because there were a few doctors here, specialists, I could help with people, women with the fistulas, kidney problems, things like that. So I did the training and I passed. 
exam. Mm. So does that mean you almost diverted from the original idea of Kanye No, no, I didn't want to I didn't. I wanted to become more proficient because here, okay. here is if you are operating, for example, if you are doing a cesarean um, and you want, you've damaged the bladder, in most countries, they just call another specialist for bladder. But in, a, in Africa, I wanted to be double, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. which I did. That's I was actually, uh, um, I was actually inspired by my lecturer. His name is Dr. Ranyarare. He's James Ranyarare. He's still alive. He was a lecturer, uh, a very good man, and he was very really clever. And he had also done the same in UK, he trained in UK. And uh, he, he had double fellowship, so I said, look, I want to be like him because, you know, he was, you know, he was quite smart. He inspired you. I see, oh, yeah. Ranyarare. I know him, I've yeah. actually interacted with him, I interviewed him. I like to meet him, I think, he's, yeah. He's around. Yeah. Okay, so after your training at Nottingham, how did you then venture into fertility treatment as a specialist in this field? You see, when you become, a spe when you graduate as a specialist there, doesn't mean you know everything. So you have to, it's a process. So when I became uh, finished, I became a registrar in the UK. And I never wanted to stay in the UK to follow my career there because I always had my Uganda as my heart. I wanted to come back to Uganda because Uganda government paid my school fees Buganda government paid my school fees, mm. all our people. I said, I want to go back to, to Uganda, Uganda and, and pay back. Pay back. Okay. However, the political condition was such that it was dangerous to come back here mm. um, because there was a civil war going on. So I, during that time, I got a job in uh, Kuwait because I wanted money also. Okay, from UK, you got a job in Kuwait. Yeah, I'd got a job in Zambia as a professor but I declined because they were paying me very, you know, peanut money. <laughs> <laughs> <It's Zambia. laughs> That's from 1985. Okay. So I said, uh, prof there's a chap called Professor uh, from, it was from Sheffield, Professor Cook, who was a fatite, is a fatite doctor also. He uh, got me a job in Zambia as a professor, but then I declined it. So I went to Kuwait. That's when I was in Kuwait. Uh, I was interested in fertility. I wanted to, still my mother was, you know, was the medicine, still... the herbs she was giving to people to become pregnant. Mm. But this time we were giving tablets. I was interested. This I wanted to follow that route. In the more trained part yeah, of yeah, it. Yeah. So the breakthrough came uh, when I came to Kuwait in 1986. There was a man who was the chief of the switchboard. Mm -hmm. You know, switchboard, you know these big machines? Yes. You know, when you call a hospital, then they, you know, the switchboard, transfer, yeah, transfer by the putting things like that, you know? Okay. Those things we're doing. So this man had been married for 10 years, you know, and he's been to all the doctors in the hospital where I was working. So he came to me, uh, I did scan, and then I put, put his wife on some tablets and she became pregnant so because this man was sitting on the switchboard it was just like we have whatsapp now you know you're always he, yeah he sent busy in one he sent messages to everybody about and, the pregnancy about the pregnancy okay and he said oh this doctor from britain is uh, is amazing something mm -hmm. like that okay so he made a big part for me <laughs> and my own family he promoted you. yeah and we are living in a, you know, a community with like a big campus, mm. big campus. Uh, Which hospital was that? In it was called Ahmad Hospital. Okay. Yeah, it was the biggest, the, the biggest company in Kuwait is Kuwait Oil Company, but they have a very big campus mm. where all workers stay, doctors, engineers. So people came to know. So I started getting receiving patients. Uh, so that's where I got a lot of interest, continued my interest in fertility. And eventually, 
I discovered that the company where, before I came there, they, were, they sent almost 30 patients to UK to do IVF. And they, out of 30 patients, only one patient came back with a live baby. And they were paying something like $50,000 per patient. That's so quite a lot of money. Yeah, and, that you, and the hospital where you are working, yeah, yeah. how was the price of IVF? No, no, they were not, we are not doing it. They were sending patients to UK. Okay. They didn't have any facility for IVF. So there had been a professor who had come in 1983, if I went there, they, he started IVF there at the university. They put up a very nice building, costing more than $20 million at that time. So he did IVF and they got one baby. So he said, look, let me take the local people to UK to train them. But the doctors went to UK, we were not interested to... In particular. Yeah, so it was a sad. So when I came, there was nothing in the country. Mm. And then I, I met a professor from London King's College Hospital who actually delivered my, our youngest daughter, Robina. Now she's a doctor. She uh, called him and he told me, okay, we can, we can start IVF. So after the war, when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990, after the war, this doctor came and he actually, he started it and he was teaching me as he was doing it. He came around about five times so he started an IVF clinic in Kuwait mm. and trained you he trained into me. IVF. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's quite interesting. Mm. You've talked of Dr. Parsons and uh, how he came to Kuwait to start a fertility clinic and while he was training you into becoming what you are today. So tell us what happened during that training and how it came to the extent of inspiring you to have your own fertility hospital. So this Professor Parsons from King's College Hospital, he came um, about five times. So every six, every three months he was coming. So he told me what to do. And we had patients. The first time he came, success rate was 60%. Subsequently, it was quite a very high. It was high, high really yeah, high. Yeah, yeah. And she had, he had also a very good embryologist um, her name is uh, Dr. Uh, I think Anne. She was one of the top embryologists in the UK. She was trained in New Cambridge. She's, uh, and then, of course, um, I, when I came to, to know, so I was doing it myself with my other doctors, but I was a team leader. So we continued having good success until we run into problems of uh, our success rates were going down. There was one Pakistan doctor who was, had come in and he was a friend of the manager, and, but his success rates started going down. Because the other Muslim was not coming as this man, Pakistan was there, but success rate was not so good. What could have gone wrong? Was he not as much qualified? I think there were protocols he was using. They were not so good because he has been invited. I couldn't overrule him and he was more experienced, supposedly maybe than me. We're all learning, but I think he was more, more of a, he was in control. The success rate were not good. Until when he left, the hospital management invited Professor Peter, who is here. Okay, pro that time okay. also, I was dreaming to come back because mm. I've been doing that thing for 10 years. I mm -hmm. said, look, this time has come. I need to retire. I need to go back to my country. So I started thinking of coming back. Which year was that when you started thinking of returning to Uganda? 1990s, 1999. 1999. Mm. Is that there you met Professor Peter? Professor Patton? Peter came to Kuwait, I think, 1998, 1999. So he came around that time. At that the time, we had also thinking of coming back. I didn't have a house in Uganda. That house was, and my wife was telling me, look, we, this is not our country, let us. So we started building a house through a contractor here in Uganda. 
by from 1999-2000, the house was a five bedrooms structure and a bungalow. So after it had been completed, it fell down. Wow, so all my show. my earnings in Kuwait, everything perished on the yeah, house. perished on the house. Oh, that was unfortunate. Yeah. So here you're planning to come back, building a house, yeah. now it collapses. This uh, Ugandans, you know, they corrupt. Some people of this, some people are corrupt. You know, he, the money, you know, really hard and money, almost two hundred thousand dollar. What did you do to the contractors after making? They run away. Was, because you were not here. They were not aware I wasn't here. So, but you know, you if somebody gives you money to do things, you know, why should you steal him? Okay, that's one character you find in some people. I and I had, my contract had only one year before I could leave the job. So, there I was, no house. And you're planning to leave the job? Yeah. And my contract was going to finish that time, yeah, because also every place has got politics. So politics that time was difficult that I couldn't continue. It worked yeah. So, so what happened when the house, you know, collapsed and you know collapsed, you have one year to leave the job? So that's that's a question. So I prayed. I went to the bank. Okay. And they gave me some money. I borrowed some. I took a loan. Because the bank didn't know that I'm going to leave the job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then I was thinking, how am I going to pay this bank yes. after, if I've, I've left? Anyway, I took my faith and, and came and started building. I have to sell my, uh, you know, I have to sell my you know, investment, things like that in UK to, to you know, when something Someone happens. Build here. Yeah, yeah, you have to sell my, you know, my savings, things like that. So which year did you come and build where? Where did you build? Now, it's very interesting. In 2001, uh, when that house collapsed, I decided, I told my wife, let me go and do, construct my safe, the house, or supervise, be there physically. Because this money I'm borrowing from the bank, we sold our assets we had. Mm. So I used to come every three months. Okay. And uh, spent two weeks here, and supervising. Actually, even if fetching the the, the, the water, sand, the sand, the the sand. I had a, I bought a small van. So I used to go on in Tebe and bring sand here. Yeah. Also started making bricks at home okay. in a way we were renting. Mm. So something like that. So um, as I was doing building this house, one of my wife's sisters. She has a friend, her name is Joyce. Mm. She was, she had infertility awareness. She was, she had a club for infertility awareness. Mm. So she used to invite me at her home house, collect patients under the mango tree. Mm. And I could see the patients under the mango tree. Consultation. Yeah. Consultation under the mango tree, yeah. While you are building, hey, I could is go. this the building you're referring to? No, yeah, this is the building I'm referring to. Yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah. So, I realized that she, she actually, she had accumulated about 100 patients who needed IVF, mm -hmm. who had blocked, yeah, who needed IVF. So I went back to Kuwait, I said, look, this is, we have patients now, mm -hmm. then we go and buy equipment, slowly, slowly. slowly yes. But I knew that time, 2000, 1999, there was an IVF clinic in, uh, in Gulu. In Gulu, here in yeah, Uganda. In Gulu, okay. Uganda. Somebody started it. But since 1998, they had not got any pregnancies. I wasn't aware until I, I, the company which sold a, a, a special equipment, microscope, called XC machine, mm. which injects, we used to inject sperms into the eggs. Mm. He told me, I've sold a machine in Gulu. I said, why? Are they doing research on monkeys or gorillas mm. or something? <laughs> he refused to tell me. Okay. <laughs> he kept it secret. That was you know, his marketing yeah, yeah. You know, ways me, of I've doing I've sold this document to you. Maybe that person can, you can borrow it because it's quite expensive. Mm. At that time, that document is maybe $150,000. Wow. Which is quite a lot of money. Mm. 
Uh, he told me, maybe you can ring them, they can borrow you that, you can use it for one week, two weeks, and then, so I called those Gulu people. Mm. I wrote to them, they never answered anything. Okay. They didn't. I thought actually they were doing research on gorillas or monkeys <laughs> or something, you know? This is what I... You never had it in your mind that there I never be had it until only when we started here. Uh, I received about 20, 15 patients who had been in that clinic. So that was 2003, 2003. when you started? Yeah, okay. yeah. They came, no, 2004, they, oh, they came, they're telling me, oh, we've been in Gulu and uh, doing IVF there. None of, the, all of us became pregnant because they know each other. How did you start up here in Ukoto, Women's Hospital International and Fertility Center? Now, when I was in Kuwait, as I told you, that we are having poor results. Uh, so a friend of uh, Professor Peter, who they went to school together, uh, Dr. Hatem, he advised the company, the hospital, that they knew somebody called Peter Plato, who was a clever man. He had also gold medal and things like that. And he was doing fertility treatment and is very, you know, high flyer. So we actually invited him to come and do troubleshooter. Why? Yeah. They are in Kuwait. Yeah, we're in Kuwait. So he came to Kuwait, he's a young man, so he came and um, we, the other chap, I mentioned the Pakistan man, he was not, he was, was, not was, he was, yeah, so he left, so he came and he was he started telling us about the protocols, what you do, A B C D like that, and our results started going high. That's the time when I was also planning to leave, because as I told you, I was, my contract was about to finish, to come over. So, when I got the equipment, I invited him here. Actually, when he came, first time he came, I invited him to my house. He had come with his dad. In Kuwait, in Uganda? In, in Kuwait, okay. yeah. He, Professor Peter, he visited, first time he came to Kuwait, he came with his dad. Mm. His dad was a mayor of Brussels for quite a long time. So, being a mayor in Europe is you know, it's quite, it's not it's a like a mayor of Bukoto, it's not like a mayor of Bukoto, it's a big, big... <laughs> it's a big deal. <laughs> yeah, big deal. Yeah. Okay. So, he was very friendly and uh, he came with his embryologist and I uh, invited him for dinner and... Uh, after when I came here, I wrote to him, I said, look, I'm starting an IVF in Uganda. Um, can you come and help us? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't hesitate. He didn't, he didn't ask hesitate. questions. No, no, he didn't ask questions wow, at all. So I, I lined up patients here. Mm -hmm. And he came. We treated, I think, 13, 13 patients. And... Uh, Four became pregnant. That was which year? 2003. 2003. 2003. Okay. I remember one of our patients, actually, who's produced, yeah, couldn't produce a sample. Couldn't. Produce a what sample? Yeah, he couldn't, yeah, semen sample. Okay. Yeah, I think he, he couldn't produce a sample. He lost sperm count. He didn't, couldn't produce a sample. So we have to wait for him for him for a long time. He had to go back home. And uh, his wife, after removed the eggs, they went back home. Then we got, uh, um, I will not mention names, but we, we, we had a very successful, actually, treatment. Four patients became pregnant, and uh, including the first, of course, the first IVF baby. Uh, I will not mention the name because the parents may not want to know the name. And that's how it's, And then he was coming every six months, and we continue like that since 2003 up to now. So 2004, you register your first successful yes. IVF mm. baby. Are how did you feel about that? Cause now, when this patient became pregnant, one of the, that lady who delivered the first baby, because we didn't have a hospital here, there was just a clinic, nothing. So she has to go to Mulago. So when she got to Mulago, those midwives and doctors there, they were, they were not happy. 
about this lady, about IVF. So they sent her back to me. So you go back to Dr. Sally. And you didn't have a hospital? No, I didn't have a hospital. Yours just was... like I was standing in my clinic in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, in the kitchen. What a humble beginning. Yeah, in the kitchen. So the laboratory, the office. Yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this lady is you know, so sent back she, from Lago. She was also diabetic. So I went with Professor Peter there to see her on the ward. So I, we told this doctor's midwife, look, this IVF is like, you know, the baby is going to be. I think the, their impression was they were thinking maybe the baby is going to be a, what, you know, abnormal or something. You know, they meant, the way people think. They but did they not thought, know what IVF yeah, looks like. Yeah, how the baby look like also. Okay. So they were saying, you go back to the doctor's side. You know, no, we will not deliver you here. Mm. But the woman was diabetic. And she, and she was a deal. Be, yeah, she needed to be in the hospital. So what happened? So, so this went on for quite many patients. So until I decided, look, let me have my hospital. You know, so that lady was delivered to September 2004. Okay. From baby. your hospital, from Lago State? From Lago. Okay. From Lago. Okay. So how did you feel about, you know, that this is your first miracle in the country? Oh, yeah, it was exciting. It was very exciting. I didn't know this This was the first one until later on. Because okay. I thought maybe Gulu, maybe Kenya or mm. other places had should IVF babies. But later on, I discovered actually there wasn't. That was the first milestone here. Mm. So now uh, we are going to look into milestones. You know, we have looked at the first milestone, the first baby here. I understand IVF can also yield multiple pregnancies. Mm. So when did you register the first twins, triplets? The first and twins so on? actually it was appeared in the new vision. The, the opening of the clinic also appeared in the new vision. We need to get a copy of that one. Okay. The sec the twin, the first twin was a Rwandese also appears in that new vision that when the president article. came to open the clinic in 2005. Okay. The first twin was the Rwandese. Remember that man, he was working with an agricultural company. Mm -hmm. Up to now, is really the kids have grown up. These are the first twins in East Africa and Central Africa. Wow. Wow. It was the Rwandese. Wow. Also, we had the first surrogate mom in 2005. Still the first in the region? Mm, first in the region. Okay. In 2006, we had the first frozen baby. First frozen is in the picture here. 2006. Yeah. First baby arising from frozen embryos. Okay, so here you are. You, you know, you're getting miracle babies. Someone might mm. call them miracle babies. Mm. Why still with Dr. Peter or you had now grown your own stuff? We trained some staff, uh, some of them, we, the chemistry did not match. And uh, of course, you know, when people you give them jobs and they don't match your chemistry. Mm -hmm. And the expectations, maybe. The expectations, mm. yeah. Professor Peter, even he went to medical school and said, look, let us start training doctors. So with the dean of medical school, Dr. Wan Kambo, Sewan Kambo yeah, at Makere. Yeah, eh? Makere and okay. the head of the Department of Obstetrics. They spent the whole day here mm. to see what we are doing. And they sent some students. Among them was a doctor, Dr. Zake. He came and he trained here. We trained him. He now has independent IVF clinic. Okay. And others, Dr. Andebat also came here. We trained him. Okay. Um, and others, yeah. And from Kenya also we trained some. Okay, now um, as one of the pioneers of fertility treatment here in the region, uh, what loopholes have you seen so far in this industry, in this uh, health challenge? What do you mean by loopholes? The loop, uh, in terms of maybe research, people not knowing about the services. Yeah, I think one of the problems here um, a lot of people don't understand exactly what IVF is. A lot of is a lot of myth behind it. They think a baby is growing in a machine uh, from zero to nine months. Mm. In fact, they think the babies who grow, who are produced by IVF, they are 
not normal human beings. This is a, a myth which is which we need to expose it. A lot of people. That's why when we started the program on uh, ITV, is it ITV? Hello yeah. TV. Uh, just to educate people about IVF, because there's no other way we can actually bring awareness to the, our our people in the public other than TV. A lot of people don't read newspapers, so TV and radio, maybe. So we put up programs on radio and TV. But how many people can actually, can you reach? So there's a, still a lot of people don't know exactly what the IVF means. Mm. And the, most people think it's extremely expensive. Uh, that myth also is, goes out. Yes. That I charge, our clinic is charging 400 million something Uganda shillings. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is not true. Which is not true. And 20% of our patients we treated for actually free of charge. Okay. But we don't want to publish this kind of information. Okay, so doctor, we are so, just limiting the conversation to IVF, mm. but uh, aren't there other causes and treatments for infertility that we offer here? Just take us through those. Uh, IVF, IVF, you know, natural con you want to understand IVF, you need to understand how natural conception takes place. There's a, a man, a man should have a normal sperm count, and the woman should have her fallopian tubes open and she has also eggs from the ovaries. So a man and his wife, that's how natural conception happens. Now, if, the, for example, if the sperm count of a man reduces, natural conception may not take place. Or if the, the tubes of a woman, fallopian tubes and seke gets blocked or some issues, Again, those are the two key. Uh, about 60% of causes of infertility is due to a woman. 60% her tubes are blocked or they are not working. There's blockage and also not functioning. Menstruation doesn't mean your tubes are open. A lot of people think when I'm menstruating, my tubes are open. Again, this is a myth. A myth. You're, you might be menstruating, but your tubes are blocked. So these women have tubes are blocked, they need IVF. A man lost sperm count, needs IVF. No shortcut. There's no shortcut. Okay. Which doctors will not help you? And then now when we are looking at the surgery part of it, what surgical operations do you offer at this hospital? We offer laparoscopy and hysteroscopy. Laparoscopy is we look at the tubes, you know, in real time, real so like you see me, you can mm. see my nose how it looks. Okay. So we look at the tubes, we see whether they are okay or not. Maybe we do something about them. Mm. So that's the surgery we carry out. Also, fibroids is quite a common problem here. Mm. Sometimes surgery, people will carry out uh, fibroid surgery. They, we tend to damage the tubes. A woman who has had fibroid operation and she's not becoming pregnant means her tubes are damaged. Okay. Because those are the surgeries we do. Uh, laparoscopy, fibroid, and uh, basically that's it. How about in men? In men, men who have got uh, esospermic, esospermic men who have no, they are producing, they ejaculate, but ejaculation, they ejaculate, there's no sperm, mm. we can operate on them. Okay. by extracting sperms. That's quite interesting. We have looked at the trainings, the practical experience, the theoretical experience. So um, what have you done with that experience that you have amassed over the years? Now, with my experience, uh, I need to leave my, I need to share my experience with, with other people, with young people, as we're getting out of this getting older, so what happened there, what happened, my legacy. Yes. So because of this, I started writing some books. Okay. I've written a book, um, Male Infertility, uh, Female Infertility. Mm. Um, we also written a book about 400 questions, frequently asked questions in mm. reproductive medicine, okay. which is coming up. 
also written a book about fibroids oh, yes. because fibroids is quite uh, common here. Uh, yeah. Also, we have a book coming up about uh, age and infertility. Age, especially in 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 women, men who don't age. In terms men, of reproduction. Yeah, in terms of reproduction, a man can. I remember Bina Issa. Uh, he was he produced a baby 120 years. <laughs> That's an advantage so, on men. Yeah, so men, we don't age okay. in our production. And maybe we don't age so much in the brain also. <laughs> so this is a joke. Okay. Okay. Then in terms of uh, mentorship and training other doctors, what can you pride in so far? Now, we, we planned, we started as a school, for teacher school, a productive school. For doctors and nurses. Okay. This is coming up to one and a half years. It's about to be recognized, mm. registered, but everything is there. Would it be the first in the country or in the region? To be the first, I think, if in Sub Sahara. Wow, that's mm. quite a big one. Sub Sahara. So, what's happening in this school? What are you training people into? How can one join? Just a brief about that school. We are one to because a lot of, because of infertility is not taught in medical school, even at postgraduate level, it's very, they're scratching, you know, mm. the tip of iceberg. So we want to really to go in detail. So patients are poorly man managed. Uh, you find so many problems, issues, how patients are managed, and this is infertility. We need to address that problem so that we teach our young doctors and nurses how to manage patient. It's very, very simple. So we may made it very simple. So we, when, once we open up, mm. people can apply and come some courses for three months, six months, one year. Okay, that's quite interesting. So you may think that maybe um, my competitors, you know, I'm, I'm not fearing competitors now. Okay, oh, that's interesting. Mm. Well, talking of competitors, I understand you have spread, you know, branches here in Uganda, in Tanzania, in Zambia. Tell us briefly, what has inspired you again, you know, to how to grow this hospital and go into other countries? <coughs> and what do you intend to do? Are you going to grow further or you, you just want to be in these three countries? No, this, we wanted to spread our news to all other countries. Uh, Rwanda had invited me, uh, the government invited me a long time ago. So we went to Rwanda, but we pulled out about two years ago. I will not tell you the reasons why. Zambia, some patients were driving from Zambia to come to Kampala. So we said, look, this so is the hospital that started from yeah, the kitchen. Yeah. It's okay. quite a long journey. From Zambia to Uganda yeah, is almost 2,000 kilometers, mm. maybe more. More, more actually. <clears throat> Tanzania, the same story. The uh, patients were coming from Tanzania. And uh, so one of the patients who succeeded invited us to go to Tanzania. Tanzania, and they've opened up a clinic there now for 10 years. Where is that hospital located in Tanzania, and what is it? It's uh, those who know Dar es Salaam. There's a place called Mikochini. Mikochin. It's about five kilometers from the center. And also, we have also a hospital in Dar es Salaam in a place called Masaki. So we have two hospitals in Dar es Salaam. Okay. They uh, offer fertility treatment specifically, or there are other additional medical one services? One of the hospitals is just a general hospital. Okay. We, we offer a, any services, any hospital. And gives. the other is specialized? It's specialized. Then how about in Lusaka? Lusaka, we own a women's hospital. Where is it located? It's located in the place called uh, Woodlands. Woodlands. Yeah, very Lusaka. close to State House. Okay, that's We cool. share the same power with the State House. Oh, that's quite <laughs> interesting. Yeah, speaking so of... power doesn't go... Wow, wow, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's quite that's interesting. Point, yeah. State yeah. Yeah. Okay, we've talked of, uh, let me take you back briefly, we've talked of <laughs> mentorship. You've talked of the few individuals you've mentored and the school you are establishing. How about here, the people you're working with? Uh, haven't you seen someone you could say, this one can be my next doctor, sir, in case time comes oh, and you okay. retire? Now, one of my one of my children, Dr. A lady, she's her name is Dr. Robina Sari. She's now qualified and she's working with me wow. and she's doing gynecology. Hopefully, within the next two years, she'll be a specialist. 
Oh, that's quite interesting. Yeah. I so, want to hope you inspired her into yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe one day we'll talk to yeah. her. And, uh, so, of course, you know, we, we have grandchildren also, they're coming up. Okay. Hopefully some of them will become into my footsteps. Wow, that's quite interesting. That's so, wonderful. And, um, and of course, uh, my children, all of them, mm. one of them is also embryologist. Okay. I think the first, if you're first qualified embryologist, and you, yeah. You're he's also of, employed in this he's hospital. He's employed here. His, his, his name is Arnold Sadi. Oh, he's embryologist here. Oh, oh, that's interesting. The others, my two sons, uh, some is IT, because also contributing quite a lot. Because mm. all these things, this is the only, it's a team networking, you know. Okay. Is networking, you need IT, you need um, my daughter, she's also helping, my other son is also helping. So, mm. we are, it's a, it's a family business now. Okay, it yeah. is. And but where we is... are also extending it to other people who want to come and, okay. and be with partner. We have also helped some, uh, remember there's a doctor, his name is Joseph Kafuma. He, he passed his A level, but he couldn't be sponsored by government, so he came. And uh, he's now a doctor and he's, he's also going to become a gynecologist. We're also offering three vacancies a year to help uh, medical st students or doctors. Yeah. People want to, we're sponsoring them, okay. pay, pay their school fee, we're paying their school fees. Every year? Every year. Oh, that's, that's quite interesting. Yeah, so if they wanted to call, stay here, so you know, the legacy continues. Yeah, it has gone. Where is Mrs. Sally in all of this? Mrs. Sally, wherever there's a successful man, there must be a successful woman behind. Wow. <laughs> I think you know that. I do. Yeah? Your wife is very sorry, you know? Mm -hmm. As you, she, so my wife, she's been behind supporting us. And she's, uh, she's actually managing the, the place. The hospitals, yeah. all the branches. Yeah, all branches, yeah. Okay, that's an interesting one. Okay, Dr. Sally, um, I understand there are three people you keep mentioning in your journey, and that is your mother, that is Mrs. Sally, and Professor Peter Plato. You have already talked about your mother and how she inspired you into this. May her soul rest in peace. And you have talked about how Mrs. Sally pays you salary. That's quite interesting. But then who is Professor Peter Plato in your life, in your journey, and what has he contributed towards what you are? Today. Okay, Professor Peter is, uh, I really don't know how to describe because I think God brought him first time when I was in Kuwait. I think if he, God had not brought him, then I, th I look back and say, you know, this IVF, IVF is not very easy. Mm. Uh, and uh, people have tried it, many doctors have tried it. It's not easy. A lot of them have burned their hands, their fingers. Okay. So I think Professor Peter, he has been an instrument, very instrumental, because he's academic, is also practical. He knows, he's done a lot of research in fertility uh, medicine, mm. and he also made some discoveries. How often does Professor Peter come to this hospital, and what does he offer? As he comes here, he basically he gives us technical technical knowledge, um, equipment. He, he advises what to buy. Uh, difficult cases, he handles them. Um, anything that is difficult, we leave it for him whenever he comes. And sometimes we could consult him on phone, and we became. Uh, friends, mm. we visit each other when we go to his house, we start his house, mm. and um, he, you know, like that, so he, he would go home to his house, mm. uh, takes out nice top restaurants, wow. in Brussels, <laughs> Mussels, you yeah. know, <laughs> I don't know, you know what Mussels, but don't. it's like in Senene here, oh, okay. but there in the Europe is called Maso. So, in yeah, simple terms, like that. Professor Peter has become oh, yeah. part of your life. Part of it. Mm. That is uh, just a little about who Dr. Edward Tamale Sali is, because I understand he is a medical doctor, he is a businessman, he is a pastor, he's an all-rounder. But well, for now, we say let's focus on his medical 
journey plus what has family and friends have contributed to what he is of today. You have heard Dr. Edward Tamale Sali share his journey, expertise and exper experience in fertility treatment. Where we are now is the hospital that started from the kitchen as a clinic 19 years ago. But as we speak, Women's Hospital International and Fertility Center has spread its wings in Uganda, Tanzania, and Zambia. If you are there grappling with infertility, feel free to visit us. In Uganda, we are located in Bukoto, Kampala. In Tanzania, we are located in Dar es Salaam. And in Zambia, we are in Lusaka. Come, inquire, talk to doctors, and overcome infertility and enjoy the joy that comes with having children in your home.